Hello students, today we will discuss the current affairs for the 31st uh, and uh, some of the topics that are there uh, today are uh, related to labor codes. These are the most important ones that we will discuss today. Uh, also center has uh, pulled back AFSPA in some of the states. So these two are very important from the perspective of both prelims as well as mains. We will also discuss the charter formation of BIMSTEC which is a very recent topic and it is of very high importance to India from the international perspective. You can expect a question from this. Also because of BIMSTEC it's been 25 years since BIMSTEC was created. Fuel cell electric vehicle we have discussed this earlier but we shall uh, revisit it again. Okay, So these four topics are pretty important uh, today. Moving on. Now, why is BIMSTEC in the news? Because Prime Minister Modi has called for strengthening the BIMSTEC and he has also welcomed the unveiling of the charter of the organization. Okay, so till now BIMSTEC was working without any charter. BIMSTEC had no charter. And what happens when uh, organizations work without a charter? Then they don't have any fixed rules. They don't have any fixed uh, meetings. They don't have a fixed agenda. So, uh, you know, it was becoming a problem. So there was a need felt in order to establish a proper order in the BIMSTEC and make it more uh, regularized. Okay, so that was the reason why the charter was introduced. And recently, the at the fifth summit meeting, summit meetings are meetings which happen at the level of the head of the state. So at the fifth summit meeting, which was held in Sri Lanka, the charter was unveiled. Now, the fifth summit meeting included in Colombo. Some of the important outcomes of the summit was the adoption of the BIMSTEC charter and the signing of the BIMSTEC master plan for transport connectivity. Now, what will the BIMSTEC master plan for transport connectivity do? It will increase or it will make it easier for transport uh, of goods and of people from one country to another. This will automatically increase more economic activity between the countries it will boost the trade between countries and will also improve our ties between countries okay so uh, what else was there during the summit meeting there was also signing of three bimstick agreements now these three uh, bimstick agreements they represent the progress that is being achieved in the ongoing cooperation activities. Now, what are these three uh, agreements that were signed? BIMSTEC Convention on Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters. So, if at all there are criminal activities which are conducted in one country and people are escaping to another country, you know, then there will be mutual uh, working on that particular case. That's an example that I'm giving. Also, there was the BIMSTEC, BIMSTEC Memorandum of Understanding and Mutual Cooperation in the field of diplomatic training. So, these countries will get together and ensure proper diplomatic uh, training for diplomats, for foreign secretary officials. Memorandum of Association on the Establishment of BIMSTEC Technology Transfer Facility was also signed. So, these three agreements were signed. Uh, the theme of the BIMSTEC meeting was Towards a Resilient Region, Prosperous Economies and Healthy People. Now, the Prime Minister also announced a $1 million grant for the operational budget of the BIMSTEC Secretariat. Okay, see, please remember that the BIMSTEC Secretariat is in uh, Dhaka. Okay, it's in Dhaka. And the Prime Minister has given around $1 million of grant for the operationalization of this Secretariat. And another USD, $3 million for grouping sent for the BIMSTEC's Center for Weather and Climate. So for this as well, the government has announced $1 million. The Prime Minister called for a free trade agreement between the member countries. Okay, now what was in the charter of the BIMSTEC that was recently announced? Under the charter, members are now expected to meet once in every two years. Earlier, it was just a word or it was just a, an agreement that countries had to meet once in two years uh, though the BIMSTEC was formed in the year 1997 till now only five summit meetings have happened if two if people if countries had to meet once in two years then there should have been many more summit level meetings but there have been only five which means that the summit level meetings were not happening regularly so announcing a charter uh, will make it more regularized with the charter BIMSTEC now has 
an international personality it has an emblem it has a flag okay so that makes it more regularized and it makes it more organized it has a formally listed purpose and the principles that it is going to adhere to it represents a significant evolution of the grouping Uh, for developing the organization into a formal structure the leaders of the member countries had agreed to divide the working of the grouping into seven segments earlier bimstech had about 14 segments 14 technical uh, you know technical subjects that uh, countries were taking uh, care of like say for example uh, transport communications trade these were the different different subjects there were 14 subjects and each country was in charge of improving one uh, particular uh, one particular function or some particular functions however now these uh, group how how now these functions have been grouped into seven segments from the 14 segments with india providing the leadership to the security pillar the prime minister mentioned the necessity of coastal shipping ecosystem and electricity grid interconnectivity as two of the necessary components of evolving the shape of the bimstech okay now bimstech master plan for transport connectivity like what we had discussed it will provide a framework for regional and domestic connectivity now more on the bimstech see the bimstech was originally envisaged through the bangkok declaration in 1997 okay initially it had only about five countries okay and later on two more countries uh, joined in the year 2004 there were two more countries that joined which were nepal and sri lanka now what is the significance of the bimstech it connects a uh, different completely different uh, you know regions like it connects the himalayas with the bay of bengal both of them are extremely strategic and it connects south asia with southeast asia okay so its members lie in the littoral and adjacent areas of the bay of bengal constituting a contiguous regional unity out of the seven members five are from south asia which are bangladesh bhutan india nepal sri lanka and two are from south east asia which are myanmar and thailand okay now bimstech not only connects south and south east asia but are also the ecologies of great himalayas and the bay of bengal what is the significance of bimstech for india of all the countries bimstech has greater significance only from for india like say for example uh it allows india to pursue three core policies such as neighborhood first act east because of the connect with southeast asia and also economic development of india's northeastern states why because most of the bimstech countries are uh, you know they are located around the bay of bengal and one region that can be acting as a bridge between india and southeast asia is the northeast hence bimstech can be used to develop the northeastern region this is also visible from uh, india trying to improve roadways and connectivity through the kaladan multimodal project through india myanmar uh, thailand trilateral highway uh, all these projects also bimstech is very important for india because sark is a non moving entity because of pakistan sark does not function well due to the presence of pakistan and hence india has to look for one more uh, regional grouping that can function well and can replace the sark and bimstech fits this role perfectly okay also bimstech contains countries like myanmar and this especially this fifth summit meeting it had the involvement of myanmar and hence the entire world was looking up to what will be the outcome of this summit level meeting also it allows india to counter china's creeping influence in the region through its belt and road initiative 
It is also a platform for India to engage with its neighbors uh, as the SARC has become dysfunctional due to the activities of Pakistan. Now, these are the different 14 different areas of cooperation that I had spoken about trade and investment, technology, energy, transportation and communication, tourism, fisheries, agriculture, cultural cooperation, environment, disaster management and each of the member countries, they guide the way in at least one or more of these sectors. Okay, now I have given a comparison between SARC and BIMSTEC over here. You can go through it. Okay, now moving on. The second topic for the day is the Bamiyan Buddhas. Now, why are the Bamiyan Buddhas in news? Because the Taliban regime, recently, the Taliban regime it had said that it will protect the ancient Bamiyan Buddhas in Mess Ayanak. What is Messianic? It is the largest copper site in Afghanistan. And that is also one of the reasons why China wants to enter into Afghanistan. It is believed that the amount of economic resources that Afghanistan holds are equivalent to $1 trillion. Okay, And hence China wants to enter into Afghanistan to be able to exploit this $1 trillion. And even the Taliban, you know, it needs funds right now. And that is the reason why uh, the Taliban is saying that they will protect these Bamiyan Buddhas. And just to be remembered, the Taliban during its first regime, it was the entity that actually blasted these statues. You know, Taliban, in the first Taliban regime, the Bamiyan Buddhas were blasted using uh, RDX. You know, they, they were blasted using bombs. Previously, they brought down the centuries-old Buddha statues in Bamiyan using artillery, explosives and rockets. The apparent change of the heart over the Messianic statues seems to be driven by economic interests. With China saying that they will invest only when there is peace and stability in Afghanistan. Okay, now what are these uh, Bamiyan Buddhas? They are these huge uh, sandstone Buddhist sculptures which are located in the Hindu Kush mountains along the river Bamiyan. And it was a part of the Silk Route. And uh, since it was a part of the Silk Route, there was a cultural mix and there was economic uh, boom, which led to this construction of these Bamiyan Buddhas. Why am I saying cultural mix? Because these Bamiyan Buddhas, they have different... Uh, uh, styles which are mixed into them like say for example they have roman draperies and they have different mudras okay so it is a mix of both hellenistic styles sassanic styles as well as you know indian uh, styles uh, and they were built in the 5th century ad which means around 400s 400s of ad okay now the bamiyan buddhas we will read more about them. The Bamiyan Buddha statues, they have been cut from sandstone cliffs, like what I we spoke of. And they are from the 5th century AD. The two most prominent statues, I, you can see a picture of the Bamiyan Buddhas over here. Okay, these two statues, these are statues of, these are the statues of the various Bodhisattvas, such as, uh, Vairochana and Sakyamuni. Please read about the different different Bodhisattvas. The others are Amitabha. Uh, you also have uh, Avalokiteshvara. You have Vajrapani. You have Padmapani. All these are the different Bodhisattvas. Uh, please uh, read about them and what they are known for. Because UPSC prelims, these are the questions that keep uh, getting asked. Okay. Now these two Buddha, these two Buddha statues, these two prominent statues are also called Salsal and Shamama. Salsal means the light shines through the universe, and Shamama is nothing but the Queen Mother. So these uh, Bamiyan statues are, pa are a part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, and hence there was a strong protest by the UNESCO when these statues were being brought down. But despite that, Taliban went ahead and blasted them off. These were actually constructed during the Kushan Empire. Ok, 
okay when the kushan empire was ruling uh, in india these were constructed and uh, because china india and rome they traded through the silk route there was economic uh, surplus and hence they could construct all these okay moving on pm yuva scheme why is it in the news it's in the news because uh the government has decided that the books selected under the pm yuva scheme are translated into different indian languages to ensure the exchange of indian culture and literature in order to promote ek bharat shreshth bharat now what is this pm yuva yojana it is a very recent scheme and uh, it expands like pradhan mantri mentorship scheme for young writers that is the expansion it has been launched by the ministry of education for young writers up to the age of 30 years the aim of the scheme is to create young aspiring writers into skilled writers who will write about the rich heritage of india through the scheme new writers will be allowed to participate and become future writers through mentorship so there is mentorship which is being provided for young uh, young writers uh, writers who are below the age of 30 years the key objectives of the scheme are to engage the youth of the country in rich indian history and culture creating a pool of young authors in the country who will be modern young ambassadors of the indian literature create young learners for future leadership roles to represent country on an international level and to help young authors project their ideas on international platform therefore allowing them to promote indian literature and culture globally now some of the other features of the scheme have been given over i'm sorry okay some of the other uh, features of the scheme are actually given over here uh it is to mentor budding young writers below 30 years of age okay below 30 years of age like what we had spoken and the selection happens through an all india contest okay uh the published books or the books that have been developed after mentoring of these young writers will be published on the national youth day okay now moving on who will implement this uh, entire scheme and uh, what are the specificities of the scheme we'll discuss that now okay the implementation of the scheme it will be implemented by the national book trust under the ministry of education the scheme will be implemented in a phase manner which means it has two phases in the first phase there will be training of the selected candidates and in the second phase the candidate selected would expand their understanding and hone their skills through interactive processes at various events internationally organized such as book fairs and all so in the first phase they'll be trained and in the second phase they'll be honed i mean their talents and their skill sets will be honed by participating in various book fairs and all of that okay now moving on how uh, okay the next uh, topic is fuel cells and fuel cell electric vehicles we have discussed this topic a lot of times however uh, we shall do it one more time because the union minister for road transport had visited the parliament in a fuel cell electric vehicle earlier we had discussed about toyota is uh, collaborating with the indian automotive uh, industry in order to develop a fuel cell electric vehicle called toyota mirai Toyota Mirai which is the most advanced fuel cell okay now uh, uh how does this hydrogen energy fuel cell work okay it works through this process called electrolysis we had discussed this electrolysis process if okay so this is a fuel cell and let's say for a fuel cell you have uh two components one is the anode and the other one is the cathode okay anode and cathode a fuel cell is nothing but it takes electrical energy it uh, has a chemical reaction and it produces electrical energy through this chemical reaction you have hydrogen and oxygen which are input into this fuel cell and through the interaction of hydrogen and oxygen 
you have electronic ions i mean sorry electrons which are produced and this electrons is nothing but electricity it is the electrical energy okay so a fuel cell it uses positively charged ion such as hydrogen and these hydrogen ions they move across the electrolyte okay so one second i will just make it better at the anode you are sending in hydrogen and at the cathode you are sending in oxygen okay so over here hydrogen ions are attracted to the oxygen they are oxidized at the cathode so hydrogen ions travel across the electrolyte and they go towards the cathode while the electrons which are dispelled out they are passed on and they are used to run the car okay these hydrogen ions react with oxygen in order to produce water and hence there is minimal pollution also hydrogen has a lot of benefits as compared to conventional fuels uh, conventional fossil fuels in that hydrogen has uh, greater uh, it uh, produces lesser pollution okay it has it creates greater horsepower uh, it also has more calorific value as compared to normal fossil fuels now moving on uh we'll discuss this hydrogen fuel cell working a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle is essentially a hybrid electric vehicle wherein the internal combustion engine is replaced with a fu fuel cell stack so it is nothing but an electric vehicle only but uh, in the case of an electric vehicle you have a battery you have a lithium ion battery however over here in a fuel cell electric vehicle the major function is done by the fuel cells energy or electrical energy is produced by the fuel cells and not by this uh, stored electrical energy on the as on the lithium battery okay so that is one of the major differences now a fuel cell electric vehicle is essentially a hybrid electric vehicle wherein the internal combustion engine is replaced through a fuel cell stack Okay, like what we discussed, the onboard sources of power include hydrogen as well as an advanced battery system. So, along with this uh, hydrogen fuel cell, you also have a battery, which means that while the range of this battery vehicle is around three hundred kilometers, the range of this fuel cell electric vehicle will be nearly double. It will be around six hundred kilometers. Okay, so that is the main advantage. fuel cells generate electricity through an electrochemical process like what we had discussed and there are no moving parts in the fuel cell so they are more efficient as compared to uh, ice internal combustion engines in internal combustion engines you have pistons which uh, which are moving parts and you have other moving parts which uh, work on burning uh, this fuel so in hydrogen hydrogen cell fuel i mean hydrogen cell electric vehicles you don't have any moving parts that is a difference with, as compared to internal combustion engines now how is uh, uh, this fce different from a normal ev unlike a battery electric vehicle it does not store energy and instead it relies on a constant supply of fuel and oxygen in the same way that a internal combustion engine relies on constant supply of petrol or oxygen petrol or diesel and oxygen so in this aspect like what we had discussed a, a fuel cell electric vehicle is more similar to an internal combustion engine as opposed to a battery electric vehicle which stores energy already on it okay now what are the advantages of fuel cells the advantages of fuel cells are that they produce much smaller quantities of greenhouse gases if pure hydrogen is used the fuel cells emit only heat and water as the by product they are also energy efficient as compared to traditional combustion Uh, technologies and unlike battery powered electric vehicles most models exceed 300 kilometers of range on a few full tank okay however there are some disadvantages also the process of making hydrogen needs energy often from fuse fossil fuel sources we have discussed about blue hydrogen green hydrogen and uh, gray hydrogen so most of the hydrogen that is produced in this world is of gray hydrogen nature which uh, produces hydrogen from 
fossil fuels and in some way or the other we will be emitting out pollutants that has raised questions over hydrogen's green credentials there are also questions over safety as hydrogen is more explosive than petrol so storing of hydrogen on the car can be dangerous labor lo labor codes to take some time before they are implemented i'm sorry the long awaited introduction of the four labor codes originally scheduled to happen at the beginning of the current fiscal year may take at least 3 more months because the states have not framed rules on them why labor is a concurrent list subject so there has to be a coordination between the union as well as states in order to implement any of the subjects which are there on the concurrent list for now seven states are still left uh, without framing the labor code rules okay now what are these labor code labor codes earlier india had more than 44 labor laws they were separate labor laws okay now these 44 labor laws have been unified and they have been made into four different codes so it is making compliance much easier for industries and companies earlier they had to comply with 44 labor laws now they only have to comply with four labor codes and several of these uh, labor laws uh, the 44 labor laws were overlapping and they were conflicting with each other so this will these four labor codes will reduce all that problem now the four codes are code on wages it applies to all employees in organized as well as unorganized sector and aims to regulate wage and bonus payments in all employments and aims at providing equal remuneration to employees performing work of a similar nature the next code is code on occupational safety health and working conditions which seeks to regulate the health and safety conditions of workers in establishments with 10 or more workers and in all mines and docks the code on social security which was uh, consolidating the various laws related to social security social security means provident fund means employee state insurance you know gratuity those things and then we finally have the code on industrial relations which uh, seeks to combine different different acts which are related to uh, problems between workers and uh, industrialists such as uh, trade unions strikes and all of that now we'll discuss each of these codes in detail okay code on wages now these are the four laws that are getting subsumed by the code on wages the minimum wages act the payment of wages act payment of bonus act equal remuneration act the code will apply to all employees central government will make wage related decisions for central government related uh, avenues such as railways mines and oil fields while state governments will make decisions for all the other employee employments wages include salary allowance or any other component expressed in monetary terms it does not include bonus payable to employees or any traveling allowance okay now each of these occupations or each of these fields will be set with a floor wage the central government will fix a floor wage taking into account living standards of workers it may set different floor wages for different geographical regions like say for example zone 1 which comprises of delhi and the other north indian states can have a different floor wage as compared to zone 2 which is some of the south indian states okay before fixing the floor wage the central government may obtain the advice of the central advisory board which was established for giving advice to the central government regarding wages okay according to uh okay according to this code okay the minimum wage decided by the central or the state governments must be higher than the floor wage we have seen that the central government will fix a floor wage okay that is the central government please remember this only the central government fixes the floor wage however the minimum wage that is paid to the workers will always have to be over the floor wage okay please remember this the minimum wages decided by the central or the state governments must be higher than the floor wage in case the existing minimum wages fixed by the central or state governments are already higher than the floor wage they cannot be reduced okay now the code prohibits employers from paying wages less than minimum wages minimum wages will be notified by the central or the state governments like what we had discussed and it will be based on the time of employment 
number of pieces that have been produced during the employment and all of that minimum wages will be revised or reviewed by the center and the state every 5 years or even lesser than that it shall not be greater than 5 years okay and also for overtime the employee employees have to be paid uh, overtime wages which should be at least twice of the normal rate of wages okay the next code is code on occupational safety health and working conditions it applies to all establishments employing more than 10 workers and to all mines and docks it does not apply to apprentices apprentices are people who are working without any wages but rather just to understand the skill okay now under this there are several duties of employers there are several duties of workers there are also some rights of the workers so some of the duties of the employers are providing a workplace which is free from hazards providing free annual health examinations of employees in notified establishments issuing appointment letters to employees informing relevant authorities in case an accident at the workplace leads to death or serious bodily injury of an employee additional duties are prescribed for employers in factories mines docks plantations and building and construction work including provision of a risk free work environment and instructing employees on safety protocols okay now what are the duties and rights of the workers or the employees duties of the employees include taking care of their own health and complying with the safety and health standards and reporting unsafe work environment to the inspectors you have labor inspectors you know complaining to them they also have some rights including the right to obtain information on safety and health standards from the employer okay all of the workers they have been given specific work hours for different different works based upon their works they have been given work hours and if at all a worker is being made to do overtime work then he has to be paid twice the rate of daily wages like what we had spoken of earlier okay female workers may also work past 7 pm earlier they could not but now they can work past 7 pm and also before 6 am with their consent okay now one more important uh, point under uh, social uh, code on social security is that workers cannot be made to work for more than 6 days a week so one day has to be off also they must receive one day of leave for every 20 days of work apart from this one day of leave every week they also need to get some bonus uh, leaves based upon the number of days that they are working i'm sorry uh, we were discussing the code on occupational safety i guess before this so now we shall discuss the code on social security under the code central government may notify various social security schemes now the social security schemes are provident fund eps employee pension scheme employee state insurance employees deposit linked insurance scheme okay uh, several other ones are mentioned over here gratuity maternity benefits cesses for uh, welfare of building and construction workers you know all of them so please go through that in addition center or state governments may notify specific schemes for gig workers platform workers and unorganized workers okay the code also specifies different applicability of thresholds for schemes such as epf schemes esi schemes you know different different uh, applicabilities are given for these schemes such as the epf scheme will apply to only establishments having 20 or more employees while the employee state insurance scheme applies for establishments which have more than 10 workers even okay now uh, most of the other topics which are given over here are most of the other points under this uh, code for social security are very straightforward such as the scheme for gig workers platform workers and unorganized workers may be financed through a combination of contributions from the employer employee or aggregators for gig workers and platform workers and also the government okay it can be so this uh, if you know the provident fund okay it is actually funded from 12% of the basic salary of the employee and 12% equally is contributed by the employer okay so similarly even for gig workers and platform workers and unorganized workers you have a similar scheme 
where in the case of gig and platform workers uh, the account the aggregators will be held responsible for providing compensation or the provident fund inspections and appeals the appropriate government may inspect may appoint inspector come facilitators now these inspector come facilitators once they inspect an establishment and they have found any wrong do they have found something wrong okay they'll file a case against that particular establishment they'll also impose a fine now if at all the establishment wants to appeal it they can go to administrative authorities and also uh, after the administrative authorities if the government or if those industries they want to appeal further then they can be sent to various tribunals which are established for uh, hearing of these cases the code also specifies judicial bodies which may hear appeals from the orders of the administrative authorities for example industrial tribunals will hear disputes under the employee provident fund scheme moving on the code on industrial relations okay the code on industrial relations is the code which uh, talks about workers uh, the strikes and how to resolve disputes between workers and management over here they have defined trade unions and they have defined negotiating unions trade unions are all those people who have at least 10% of the workers or 100 workers whichever is lesser negotiating unions if at all there is one trade union no in that establishment then that will become the negotiating uh, union but if there are more than one trade unions then that particular trade union with the support of at least i'm sorry then that particular trade union which has at least the support of 51 of 51% uh, of the workers on the master roll will be the negotiating union okay the code also defines unfair labor practices like say for example if at all employer employee if employers are preventing workers from frauding forming trade unions or establishing employer sponsored trade unions all these are unfair labor practices and these can be punished okay standing orders all industrial establishments with at least 300 workers must prepare standing orders on classification of workers manner of informing workers about their work okay so these standing orders have to be formulated if at all there are establishments which are having more than 300 workers there are also a law laws under this there are also provisions under this code on industrial relations with regards to layoffs and retrenchment okay in case of uh, layoffs or retrenchment of establishments between 50 to 100 300 workers then you have separate rules uh, these are given over here and uh, in case of retrenchment or layoffs of establishments which have more than 300 uh, people then you have different set of rules those are given over here in case of uh, industrial establishments with at least 300 workers they must take the prior permission of the central or the state government and these establishments must pay 50 percent of the basic wages and dearness allowance to a worker who has been laid off in case of retrenchment the employer must give three months notice or pay the retrenched worker for the notice period now the difference between uh, layoff and retrenchment is that in the case of a layoff you know the company is not able to bear the expenses and hence it uh, you know takes off some people from its uh, company whereas in the case of a retrenchment you know the company is not happy with the performance of the worker and hence it decides to lay off those uh, and hence it uh, decides to take out those workers so that is the difference in layoff the company cannot afford to have them and in retrenchment the company is not happy with their performance okay now one very important uh, component of this code is that it allows for voluntary arbitration it allows for industrial disputes to be voluntarily referred to arbitration by the employer and workers through a written agreement after investigating the dispute the arbitrator will submit the arbitration award to the government now the next topic is center to reduce afspa in nagaland assam and manipur uh, apologies for this ao here the center had decided to reduce the disturbed areas under the armed forces special powers act okay now according to the latest notification of the ministry of home affairs the afspa which has been 
in force in Assam since 1990 is being removed completely from 23 districts and partially from one district of Assam. While in the case of Manipur, which has been under AFSPA since 2004, 15 police stations of 6 districts of Manipur will be excluded from AFSPA. And in the case of Nagaland, the centre has accepted a recommendation of the committee and it has gone for withdrawal of AFSPA in 15 police stations in 7 districts. And all of this will be in effect from April 1st. Okay, And the reason why the centre has uh, done this, the reasons that have been given by the centre are that most of the extremist organisations like the Bodo Territorial Council, you know, like the Mizo National Front, they've all given, down, given up their arms. And hence, there is no point in having uh, this draconian act such as the AFSPA still. Okay, now what is AFSPA? AFSPA is a parliamentary act that gives unfettered powers to the armed forces and the central armed police forces deployed in disturbed areas to kill anyone acting in contravention with the existing law and order. And they can also search any premises without a warrant and protection from prosecution and legal suits. They have so much of protection even if they go and they can do anything uh, like even kill people or even detain people or even go for uh, searches without any warrant they are still protected you know people of the army and people of the CAPF are still protected okay the law first came into effect in 1958 to deal with the uprising in Naga Hills followed by the insurgency in Assam I'm sorry the act was amended in 1972 uh, it was amended in 1972 because you know Assam uh, was split up Earlier, all these states were a part of Assam itself. However, in 1972, a lot of these states were taken out of Assam, like Meghalaya, you know, like uh, Mizoram, uh, all, uh, some parts of Arunachal Pradesh. They were all taken out of Assam and made separate. And hence, even the AFSPA had to be modified. And in 1972, uh, this act was modified so that it can be applied by both the center and the states. So now AFSPA can be applied even through the state governments, not just the center, but also the states can go for uh, applying of AFSPA. Currently, the Union Home Ministry issues periodic disturbed area notifications to extend AFSPA for Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh, while the notification for Manipur and Assam is issued by the state governments itself. Why? Because it was Manipur and Assam state governments which had imposed AFSPA. While in the case of Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh, it was the Union Home Ministry. Okay. Now, Tripura revoked the act in 2015, while Meghalaya was under AFSPA for 27 years until it revoked it in 2018. So, Tripura and Meghalaya don't have any AFSPA, while the other states have. Jammu and Kashmir has a separate Jammu and Kashmir Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1990. So, it is not under this AFSPA of 1950. Uh, sorry, 1958, okay. While Jammu and Kashmir has a different Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Okay. So, now this is the one of the other reasons why AFSPA has been rolled back is also because of the recent uh, arm, Armed Forces attack uh, in Nagaland, which led to the killing of several Nagaland civilians. And hence, there have been several protests against AFSPA uh, since then. So, it was a good move on the part of the central government to remove AFSPA or at least uh, reduce the uh, extent of AFSPA.